Uh, welcome, Mr. Harris. It's a pleasure yeah. to see you. Likewise, thank you for thank you for having me. Looking forward to our conversation yeah. today. It's always nice to, to, under these circumstances to communicate with people, whether it's in person or over Zoom. <laughs> right. I mean, normally I would I'd give you a virtual handshake. <laughs> right. right. I. Well, I was lucky to see a preview of the concert that you filmed for, for Hamilton, and I was very impressed, first of all, with the music, um, the interaction, and, and the quality of it. So I appreciate, and we appreciate you taking the, the time and effort to uh, create uh, the next best thing to being here. I wanted to read something from your website um, because... I was saying to myself, this video shows a very uh, high standard when it comes to quality. But this is what it said about Sonic Creed, a recent recording of yours. It says, the album chronicles the story of people and their time on the planet. It's a reflection of African-American life in the late 20th and early 21st centuries and a sonic manifestation and creed of family, community, and legacy. So I think it's safe to say that you set a very high bar for yourself and 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 blackout is that a fair statement absolutely um and bigger than the idea that i set the bar these people on the wall all around me i'm surrounded by by incredible artists exactly me too honest you know every single day i mean I, when i'm sitting at the piano or on the vibes i'm writing creating um, I, I see a photo of Duke Ellington or whoever it is in, in my room, and it reminds me of uh, the importance of staying focused on why art is important. Art is not important in our society because of the individual talent of an artist or an individual's artist, the artist's ego. Art is important because it's a reflection of what's happening in the world right now. And the reason that Herbie Hancock back here and Miles Davis, all these people uh, became so incredible wasn't just their musicianship. It's just that it has more to do with the fact that they captured the essence of what was happening in the world at that time so that we gain a better understanding of how we got to the point that we're in now. I'm glad you said that because um, it seems there's so much to reflect in the arts now. Uh, maybe just so many things that are happening all at the same time. Yet over my shoulder are Lester Young and Count Basie and incredibly to think that their music at the time was probably 80 years ago. And do you feel that what they were doing carried, carried as much significance to the community as, as what you're doing? Well, that's a, that's a tough question um, because those are my heroes. So <laughs> I'm doing the best that I can to, to gain a seat next to them, even if it's like 20 levels down. I just want to get as close to those icons as possible. But what I will say is, as we look at the development of our art form in this country, and we look at the effect of the institutionalization of the art form. So when you're looking at Count Basie or Lester Young, this is before Daz was inside of conservatories and music programs. So the music was really primarily being generated from the community outward. So when you think about a Count Basie, I don't think that there was much separation between his community here in Newark, and he's from Red Bank originally, but Newark, New Jersey, where he spent a lot of time in addition to Kansas City. Uh, he was in the neighborhoods with the people, uplifting people. So I think there was a deep sense of connection. And even when I think about Miles Davis, and, and obviously he's a genius as an artist, but I think the social strife that we were experiencing as a nation in, in the late 60s and 70s, especially as an African-American, I think we were in a space where we needed to be able to stand up, just like James Brown said, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. And I think Miles Davis represented that. Mm -hmm. And all of his intelligence, all of his elegance, all of his swagger, like I'm not gonna change who I am, I know that I'm beautiful and I'm going to lead with that. So their, their function in society was bigger than the notes. They really represented the communities from which they arose. Yeah. Bigger than the notes. I like that. I, I, I try to do the same thing, of course. And yes. you know, I, when I think about the music that we're creating, uh, I'm never picking a random song from the past because it sounds good to me. Everything on our current album is, is there because I've had a real life experience with the composer, 
where I've spent time with them and they've had some impact in my life. Okay. On this album is about my family, my wife. It's about my brothers and sisters in the world. What's happening right now? Yeah. Well, uh, keeping a, a group of musicians together for 17 years is is quite an accomplishment. I mean, keeping them together for seven days is sometimes impossible. <laughs> we all do so many things. Uh, when you're working on a tune, and perhaps in a rehearsal, and it, it's a composition of yours, how comfortable are you with, I'll use the word instructing or suggesting to your fellow musicians how to play or perhaps what not to play? <laughs> That's another great question. I, I would tell you as an improviser, I think uh, our success is pr predicated upon three fundamental values. Those values are love, trust, and respect. So when we walk into a room to learn a new piece of music, we're leading with that. I never tell Terry on what to play on the drum. Never. There's no need because I've done it maybe twice over the course of the past 17 years. And both times, what I suggested was nowhere near the level of what he came up with on his own. And the same is true of Mark and Casey. So really, when I'm composing, it's not so much that I own the idea. I think of composition is not really a creative process. It's really a process of discovery. Uh, I spend the majority of my time, like a lot of musicians, working on my ear, working on my ability to perceive possibilities. So when I sit, it's not that something's already in my mind. I find it. I say, oh, that works. Oh, and I figured that this would fit there. So I've contributed that portion. When I bring it in to the other guys in the band, they're perceiving other parts of it that I can't see. And it's, the, it's that conglomerate of imagination, of intelligence, of informed, diverse culture that creates the magic that is jazz. Mm -hmm. The music that we make is so much bigger than what I could do on my own. <laughs> it's really only possible when you have divergent perspectives, people who don't think the same way, people who disagree, who come together. Yeah. The magic lives in between those interesting spaces between disparate ideas. Yeah. I thought it was a marvelous, um, what I heard on the preview, a combination of uh, something that was obviously arranged and written out, but then it veered off, came back, and um, what you're talking about, the equal contribution of all the players, was very evident. I wanted to ask, this could be a like minutia, but I'm fascinated about musical decisions and orchestrations there's a point, uh, I believe it was in the first song, which was fairly long, and there's a drum solo. And everybody in the band, except the sax player, is going, bad at, followed by um, Terry filling in, and then another bad at, and <laughs> it, it happened a number of times. So why didn't the sax player go, bad at, I, I mean, it's like it's one of those things that sometimes he'll do it, sometimes he won't. Okay. You, know? you never know. I mean, the music is, is different every single time. And uh, it could have been uh, a conscious decision on his part that he didn't feel that that texture was necessary. Or he may have been thinking about something else. <laughs> That's the interesting thing about this art form is it's, it's really, I, I've heard Mark Carey describe it as much more of a practice, right? It's, it's not so much that you're learning music in advance and then you're executing. The actual beauty of the art form is the practice of making music on stage. So we are doing jazz when we're there together. So whatever level of engagement that you have is a manifestation of jazz, whether it is to push forward with a strong idea to influence others or to step back and give space for other people to shine. Yeah. So it's, you know, the other amazing thing about uh, improvisation is the speed of thought things happen so quickly. It's, it's actually much more connected to intuition, which I think is just a really fast form of thinking. But you can't sort of think through every step in advance because once the music goes this way, it's highly likely it's not going to continue. You don't know what it's going to do. Yeah. So if it pivots, you have to constantly be listening and ready to go wherever the, the, wherever the community, the team decides to go. Mm. I, I made note of the um, different sounds you got out of your group, the combination of 
marimba and bass in unison and piano in unison playing, you know, melody at the piano also. And I had a question about your improvising. Do you feel that you, because the marimba has very little sustain, do you think you improvise differently on the marimba than you do on the vibes? Oh, that's interesting. You know, I, I would say as an improviser, I feel more connected to the marimba because the marimba occupies a very unique frequency. So when I play the vibraphone, its frequencies have a lot in common with the piano. So I may play a couple of notes and it might actually blend with the piano. So it actually doesn't stand out quite as much. Whereas the marimba is such a unique frequency. I can go out and hit a note really softly. It would still be really clear. And there's also something about the wood, um, that organic sound that I find it to be more rhythmically articulate. And most of phrasing is connected to rhythmic articulation. So I'm, I'm a little, it's interesting, I'm a little biased towards the marimba as an improviser, but I almost never play melodies on the marimba. I love the sound of the vibraphone. It's so gorgeous and lush. It's, it's just, it's like this warm palette that just melts over the overall sound. So to play a melody on the vibraphone, you can you can feel like you're inside of everything else that's happening around you. You feel deeply connected. And then when it's time to solo, you sort of dart, I, I dart over to the marimba and it starts to <laughs> I love them both. And actually, you'll notice on the video, sometimes I'm playing them both at the same right. time. <laughs> well, I had a thought. Uh, speaking of the fellows over my shoulder, that era of musician placed a huge uh, amount of importance on being able to recognize people by their personal sound. So I have an opinion and I'd be happy for you to tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> and that is, uh, I would, th it seems to me that recognizing wind instruments because of all the things that go into the sound, the reed, the, the breath, the diaphragm, the mouthpiece, um, would be somewhat easier than to identify vibes players because you have a metal and a mallet. Uh, do you want to give me your opinion on that? <laughs> well, I'd say there's a reason that there's not a, a really long lineage of great vibe players. It's a tough instrument. It's one of the easiest instruments to start with. I mean, you basically walk up to the thing and you hit it and you get a note that's in it's a little more complicated than that, of course, but I think initially it's it's one of the easier instruments to start with compared to a trumpet, for example. But then the challenge is because you don't have all these interesting levels of expression from the instrument itself, you actually have to push more of your personal uh, expression through the instrument to make your own voice. So you can hear Dexter Gordon, a single note, and you know that it's Dexter Gordon or Lester Young Whereas the vibraphone, it's a little hard, harder to tell from a single note. Although touch has a lot to do with it. Um, uh, some people, I play with a little bit, well, I play with a wide range of touch, but in general, I have a little bit heavier touch than let's say Bobby Hutcherson, who has a really light sort of glassy touch so that the instrument uh, s sparkles almost. So you may notice a difference there, but mainly I think with the vibraphone, it's about your note choices, right? And it's about, how you phrase. So I tend to do uh, a lot of, uh, uh, like I'll put two notes together. So it's not da, it's dwa. Mm. A lot of dwi da, dwi da, di da. There's a lot of those little embellishments. Yeah. And then you hear Mill Jackson, his was more like di -di da. He would sort of take mm. three independent notes and create melisma or embellishments that are characteristic. Yeah. Um, speaking of Bobby Hutcherson, I wanted to make sure I thanked you. Last, last night I was checking out some of your recordings and I said, I was sitting in my kitchen and I went, oh my God. And my wife goes, what's the matter? And I said, well, Stefan did Bobby Hutcherson's song called Now. <laughs> and I don't want to spend a lot of time on that, but I have, I just, that song used to fascinate me. It was so beautiful, and so thank you for uh, doing a version of it. Yeah, what a what a fantastic piece of music, and it's it's uh, 
it functions in the exact way that you would hope that any great piece of music would function and that it becomes this phenomenal platform for the expression of a, of a myriad of voices. It's a mm -hmm. simple, beautiful melody that is repeated with the absolutely perfect harmony on it. Yeah. But it just sort of breathes and it allows you to step into the middle of the song and sing your truth in your own way. It's, it's a rare uh, thing to come across a composition like that. And unfortunately, that's not a piece that's very well no. known, but uh, I think hopefully the blackout recording will help. I think Joe Locke just did a recording of it, and one or two other people are starting mm. to play that too. Yeah. Definitely one of my favorites for the band to play because, because of the repeated melody, it's not so much about one soloist at a time. It's really about us coming together under this repeated melody, how do we continually change the texture around it? So mm -hmm. playing that piece of music helps uh, unite us as an ensemble and keeps us focused on our purpose. Yeah. Going back to the vibes for a minute, I had this vision of you um, as a young man, you know, be before you could tell the venue what kind of vibes and marimba would be on stage for you, I was picturing yourself like going to a gig with the vibes and like, the setup of that is is a bit of a, a, a chore, isn't it? Yes, it is. <laughs> I, did, I did it while I was young and in New York, and then I said, look, if I ever have any level of success in this business, I'm never moving one of these things again. <laughs> so, <laughs> so generally, when I when I travel, I don't bring a vibraphone or a marimba. I, whatever is available to me that day, I'll show up and play it. Right. I have the improviser's mindset so that uh, – I've shown up and there were cracked notes and but in the concert I'll use those notes. To okay. Me, the note is just a, it's a another sound that yeah. I can use in the process of improvisation. So there's, it's, I, I I remember uh, hearing uh, playing with Joe Henderson and a couple of us in the band. Joe Joe was going through a period where he was trying out a bunch of drummers, and uh, you know on occasion he tries someone who really didn't work out. So some of us, when we're, we're young, we're in the back and we're talking like, oh, man, this guy messed up my solo. And, you know, I was trying to do this and he such and such. But Joe Henderson, night after night, it didn't matter who was on the stage. He was able to make magic with unbelievable clarity, regardless of the level of the other musicians around him. In fact, he elevated everyone else. As soon as he started playing, everybody else sounded better. So that's a great lesson I think I learned over the years from playing with Joe Henderson that, you know, it's it's never the instrument's fault. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you take um, that instrument I, in the right hand, it'll be, they'll make magic with it. <laughs> okay. You mean I can't use that excuse anymore, huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, how would you like uh, music journalists and critics their, their task oftentimes is to review records and uh, concerts. If you could ghostwrite uh, a review of your own LP or, or CD or MP3, what would you say about your own music? Wow. <laughs> That's a tough question. Um, I mean, I, I think... Uh, the highest value that, that drives me is empathy. Uh, music is one manifestation of empathy, but I try to live a life with my family and how I maneuver through the world in general, always being led through the values of empathy. So I hope that when people hear my music, that it's not just about me, but you hear the community, you hear how these disparate voices are coming together to create something that is incredibly beautiful that they wouldn't be able to do on their own. And on top of that, I think it's really important that I be of service, right? Just like a chauffeur or a politician or a cook, we all have to provide some service to society. And I think the service that we're supposed to be providing as artists is we're supposed to be amplifying the voices of our community. Many parts of our communities don't have the ability to articulate themselves. We have been studying for many years and are still working on the ability to articulate emotion in sound. So when someone hears my music, I hope they hear the sound of the communities that we come from, that they hear the beauty that, that lives in our community, the pluses, the minuses, the struggle. I hope that there's some documentation about what's happening in our world right now 
extra interim. Nice. I think you should write your own reviews. <laughs> um, getting back to improvising for a moment. When we play the saxophone or the trumpet, um, we're not seeing the notes. We're, we're knowing what key we put down, what we're going to get. Is there a, a sense of sight involved when you improvise? Because the whole thing is laid out in front of you. And of course, your, your ear is the main driver, I would say. But what role does sight play in yeah. it? Well, it's, it's interesting. In many ways, of course, I appreciate sight, but it's a distraction in a lot of ways because you can look down and you can see a shape and you can decide to play that shape but maybe that's not what the music is asking for music is really a science of sound so the, the primary way that we should be receiving information is through our ear so for me a lot of times especially when i'm playing a ballad when i'm live uh, in concert what i tend to do is i stand up really straight when i'm playing a ballad and i find a point in the back of the room um, Usually there's an exit sign that's red or something that you can see. And I'll just focus on that. And I try not to look down at my instrument at all so that I'm focused more on hearing and feeling and then capturing the note that's in my ear first. Not that there's anything wrong with recognizing a pattern and playing that, but my ambition is to really continue to deepen my ability to perceive the world of sound through my ear. I'll tell you, uh, great story, something that happened to me that really helped solidify my perspective. Just a couple years ago, I got a chance to play with Wayne Shorter and Herbie Hancock. We did this big gala and I was nervous, of course. So the night before, uh, uh, John Beasley, who's a musical director, he said, hey, Stefan, do you want to write an arrangement on this tune? I said, oh my goodness, of course. So I stay up all night and I'm writing this arrangement and we have rehearsal the next day. I come into rehearsal and I have my little charts and I go over to Herbie, I'm like, you know, I go over to the bass player, James Genius, and, and then when I go over to Wayne Shorter, I say, oh, you know, Mr. Shorter, here's a, here's a chart. Wayne just says, he's like, yeah, yeah, I, I, I don't read music. I, I stopped reading music like 17 years ago. He's like, once my eyes got a little funny, I just stopped. And I was just thinking, oh my goodness, all this beautiful music this guy has been making wow. for the past 17 years has all come from his incredible ability to perceive using his ear. And that it just reminded me that what we have on paper, it's just drawings. It's not the actual lake, right? You need to get <laughs> the lake and swim, or do you want to focus on the painting, right? I think both are beautiful, but that was a pivotal moment for me. And it reminded me mm -hmm. that I really need to continue to develop my empathy, my ability to perceive what's happening around me so I would tell you probably 98% of the time that I'm dealing with music, trying to learn, I, I sing, I practice solfege, and I'm at the piano. I almost never practice at the vibes at this point, because that's very physical, and I, I have a lot of muscle memory from over the years. But it's a lot of singing away from any instrument just to develop my ear. If we decided that we wanted to com commission a new work from you and your group, is there a process that you engage in to get started? Oh, 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 oh. wow. I'm, you know, it's interesting. I'm learning as an educator. Uh, I'm currently a professor at Rutgers University in Newark, New Jersey. And I'm, I, this semester, I started working with a group of students who were really at the very beginning. We don't really play instruments. I'm starting to focus on how do we put art in the hands of the general population, not just elite young musicians. I think everybody deserves the right to experience the blessing that is creative art. Um, so I've been focusing on that a lot. And it's been really interesting because I'll be working with the students on a really basic concept. And then that simple concept will reveal a fascinating piece of music. So I just write whatever is available to me. So if I were commissioned, I couldn't tell you in advance. I'd have to say, okay, there's some space that I, I'm, I'm ready to create. I have energy, like I know that there's something that's inside of me. 
And then I'd have to just step back and be patient. Usually it takes me about two weeks before I get the momentum going. Right? So I'll get up in the morning. First thing I'll do is go right to a piano and I'll pluck at a couple of random notes. And if in 15 minutes I don't really get anything that's a tool, I'll just walk away. I'll do something else because it's not there. And then some mornings you go right to the piano and you play a couple of notes and you say, oh, my goodness, that's it. And then I can spend the next 20 hours trying to find ways to contextualize that beautiful little gem that I found. I didn't create it. I found it. And then I'm just surrounding it <laughs> with interesting things, trying to utilize my knowledge of harmony to give an emotional springboard to yeah. the melody itself. Do you ever find any little gems when you're driving in your car or taking a walk and then like, oh, I got to write this down somehow. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it can happen at any moment. And sometimes it can happen in any form, too. Sometimes it's a it's a collection of words that come to mind that turn into music. So oh. for example, on this on this concert, uh, this video, we did a piece called Let's Take a Trip to the Sky, which is a piece that I wrote for my wife. Um, I was in uh, on tour on one of our major anniversaries and I, I missed it. And I was thinking about her and I just started to write down some thoughts about, um, I've been married 20 years now. So I started to write down some thoughts about what, what is it that we need to do to, to ensure that our love continues to grow and that it stays strong and just how much I cared about her. And I wrote that down, no instrument around. I'm just in a hotel room thinking about my wife. And then when I got home, I put those words on the piano and just started to look at the emotion of every word and look for a chord that captured the feeling of the word. Wow. So that inspiration didn't come from an instrument or notes at all. It came from my dedication and love for my wife. Beautiful story. Thank you. Um, this question would be something I would normally ask uh, pre-COVID because a lot of questions are not even worth asking at this point. But let's say last July, I was able to ask you this question, and, and that is, with your students or someone looking for advice, a, a young up-and-coming musician, do you have anything you can tell them that you think is, is worthwhile for them to constantly pay attention to as they try to build a career? Well, it's an interesting, it's an interesting angle because my take on it is that uh, it's about service <laughs> and remembering that we, we're no more important than any other profession out here. We have to provide a service to society at large. And you have to wrap your head around what is it that you're providing and who is it that you want to be of service to. Once you can see that, it becomes increasingly clear how you want to present yourself. The idea that I want to be a star or something is such an abstract concept and you end up chasing a pipeline that's probably from the past, and it's it's probably a losing battle. Most people who rise to the top rise to the top because of authentic artistic expression. Really, it's just like movies or sports. I mean, my, my wife used to work for the uh, Nets and Devils, so we had season passes to the games. And I always remember loving going to the Nets game because it would start with the big announcement, and now your New Jersey Nets Right, and the, and the crowd would go nuts, and then people were like, we're doing so great, did you see, we just dunked, and it's like, no, you can do anything, you're eating popcorn, but somehow, somehow you're sitting there, and you see your own ambition represented in what is happening. I, I, I'm like, I'm a boxing fan, I, I like basketball, and I remember being a kid and watching Michael Jordan play um, on television when he had the flu, and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, this guy is like, making every shot and he's going over and he's sick, he's laying down, he gets back up. And I just remember being in high school thinking, yeah, like I, I want I want that. I, I, I think I have that kind of drive in me and if he can do it, I'm gonna push myself to do it. So as an artist, you really need, people are going to come to you because they see a bit of themselves in the art that it is that you're creating. Not because you're so smart or so creative, it's because you make them feel alive in ways that they're not able to express on their own. So service first and foremost, and then the commerce part, I think when you really have a clear sense of your, who you're serving, 
it becomes easier. It's never easy, but you know, mm. I never, I never create with with um, money in mind. I first create authentically from the bottom of the heart, and then I look around and I say, well, where is this piece of art relevant? And it's not always relevant in a jazz club or in a concert hall. Right. So for me, I've been yeah. I've been teaching in corporate settings, doing co corporate leadership training, <laughs> in addition to developing apps. And, and it's it's that I'm, I don't view myself as a musician. One manifestation of my talent happens to be music, but that can be manifested to be of service in a myriad. Well, that's really interesting, because was it a, uh, a conscious decision, let's say, and, most young musicians go through struggles as, you know, trying to make a living. Did you say to yourself, I need to do as other things as well as play mallet instruments if, if I want to create a career for myself? You know, I didn't. I, I, I don't think I ever went through that type of clarity when I was very, very young. I mean, I just love music. I mean, I still, I'm, I'm more energized. I work harder now than I ever have in my entire life. And I have so much joy and passion for music. And I think that authenticity was infectious. Ever since I was a little kid in sixth grade playing instruments, <laughs> I just led with so much happiness. And also wanting to share and connect with people in vulnerability and I think we're at a point in our society where that's that's something that's hard to come by, and people mm -hmm. have vulnerability. And then when I think about um, making a living, I remember years ago. This is after I I was already touring, um, but I remember having a conversation with a group of musicians, uh, and I was saying how, well, if you want to think about money, nothing wrong with that, but out of all the options in the world right now. You're choosing jazz if it's about money. I'm not so sure that's the best decision. And I reached the point where I said, okay, well, you know, I didn't have kids at the time, but I'm, I, want, I want to have kids one day and I want to be able to provide the best that I can for my children. I need to think more about money. So I started to read some books about real estate and investing and other things. So when I think about money, I start to think about the concept of ownership, creating something that could be a commodity that can be sold. I never think about money as it as it relates to my music or the vibraphone, I see. I like to keep that separate. Whether whether I was a you know if I were a billionaire, I would still practice just as much. You know, yeah. I'm not motivated by money for me. I wish I wish I could remember who, what musician said. Yeah, jazz is a great field. You can become a hundred air. Oh. <laughs> so so I'm going to ask you. Uh, Probably a tough question, and then we'll see if we have any questions from uh, other people who are viewing. Do you have anything that you'd like to reflect on and say about the current situation the United States is in? Wow. <laughs> I, I look back prior to our current administration. And, and I think what's at the center of what brought us to this situation is a lack of empathy. I'm gonna always go back to empathy and yeah. I should preface it by saying that I don't think that empathy has morality. Empathy is not good or bad. Empathy has, has been used for evil throughout history and it's been used for good. The most important thing though is to be able to quiet the ego first and to listen that you understand the environment in which your ideas exist. And I think what was occurring in our country was that we weren't listening to each other. You know, people on the left, people in the middle, we're totally shocked by one another. We're not paying attention to who we are and we're not getting to the root of what we really care about because we're focused on this right or wrong, this projection of right or wrong as an egocentric perspective. So for me, if there's anything I hope to contribute to this world, is I want to amplify the value, the understanding of the value of empathy. It's getting people to say, I always like to say when I'm teaching about empathy, is it, it doesn't matter what you think, it's still relevant. Right? <laughs> right now, you should be just trying to understand the person in front of you, no judgment at all. Then once it's there, 
then you can have some sense of judgment in whichever way you choose. And it's, then it's up to your moral code to decide how you want to behave. But I don't think we're in a situation right now um, where we have been paying attention to one another. And it's been great, honestly, to see uh, President-elect Biden uh, use the word empathy as much as yeah. has, because I do think that's what's going to need to happen to get the, the gears of our Congress working properly. Well, thank you for sharing that. So, Michelle, do we have any folks who would um, like to ask something of Mr. Harris? We have two questions. One is, are your improvisationals substantially influenced by your current emotions, or are you able to compartmentalize the two? Wow. Wow. <laughs> what a question. <laughs> well, you know, that's that's a great question, and, and on the – on the one hand, uh, most people would say, no, no, it's about how you're feeling, you know, that day. But I, I find that what happens for me is I may be backstage feeling one way. And then once I step out on stage, if I'm, if I'm humble and ready to receive the possibilities, I lose myself and I start to react to whatever the emotions are that are around me. So just like the audience, I'm actually on the journey as well. I don't know what it's going to be in advance. So for me to receive the, the beauty created by these iconic artists, I actually have to quiet my own ego, which is not which is not easy to do. I try to meditate before I go on stage and get in the right mindset. Uh, but then I just experience the emotion that is there. Yeah, that is a really good question. I had a brief conversation with a student about it the other day, and, and he said, I... When I'm improvising, I'm playing the way I feel, and sometimes practically you can't do that all the time. If you're going out and presenting something to a group of people and you're really down in the dumps, you still have to play for the people who are listening to you. At least that that's my my thought on that. It's, it's, that's, that's that interesting dynamic. I mean, of course, we're all individuals, and it's, it's beautiful and, and required to have your own perspective, but really... We should be playing the way that we feel, <laughs> right? Because the way you're going to be successful is the audience has to feel alive. They have to feel amplified by what it is that you're doing. Yeah. For you to just yeah. push that you feel this way if the audience feels a different way, they're probably going to be frustrated. With you. Yeah. It's not about me. <laughs> okay. All right, Michelle, you have another one? Yeah, we have both about improv. Um, one, another one is, how would you describe your process of improv? What does jazz, how does jazz improv work? Well, so much of, of jazz improvisation is directly connected to uh, language for me. Uh, when I'm improvising, I'm literally speaking in the exact same way that I'm speaking right now. I just take the words away. So all the rhythms, all the nuances are here. The way that I speak is exactly the way that I play. I can take da 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 everything I say da 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 and play it on an instrument. Right. So the type of flow that I have when we're communicating right now is the same type of flow that I want to have when I'm on stage. Now the challenge is <laughs> we're using language all the time, and mm. most of the time we're more comfortable speaking than we are playing the language of harmony is so it's not complex it's just a lot so i spend the majority of my time working on my ear and learning little tiny bits of vocabulary so that whatever it is i hear i can react to it so the goal ultimately is to not know right it's like i almost want to be able to forget everything that i'm learning i hope that one day i can get to that and just say i don't need to know what the song is let's just play and you can just hear it and react. I'm not there. A long way to go, but that's, that keeps me hungry. But again, at the center of great improvisation, um, I, I still think it's, it's empathy. Always being able to understand that your idea comes to life relative to what's happening around you. You can take a single note and just go, mm, like right at the right moment, and it's just, man, the whole audience will start clapping. <laughs> And it's just like one note. It's not even a special note. It's placement and timing relative to everyone else. Yes, and and as you notably said in your TED talk, when you play an F sharp over an F chord, you better know how to work with that. 
<laughs> okay, Michelle. Uh, one more question, and this might be the last one that has come in. It says, can you speak to the relationship between improvisation, improvisation and composition? What about the cultural politics of that distinction? <laughs> I mean, I, I, honestly, I honestly think of composition as it's just really, really slow improvisation. It's the same, it's the same idea, it's just that when you're improvising, it's happening really quickly. But fundamentally, I don't see it as the idea that I own the music, that I'm so special, that I'm creating something. I will literally go boom, you know, boom, and say, no, that's not it. I don't know why that's not it, right? And they go boom, drunk, oh, that's it. <laughs> so in my mind, the reason that I know that that's the right note is that it already exists. There are these beautiful, I also love physics, I love science, and I find that there, in theory, there's this beautiful logic that governs the behavior of all beings. There are some plants that, whatever, there's some logic that holds everything together. And what's happening for me is the more I study, the, the more I deepen my ability to see, I'm able to see those natural connections that exist. It's not that I'm creating it, but the more perceptive I become, the easier it is for me to capture the music that's there. Hmm. Those are good questions. We've 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 put some uh, some difficult uh, inquiries to you today, and uh, I appreciate your thoughtfulness. Um, we can wrap up shortly. There was one thing I wanted to, to get in. Um, this is when I listened to your your first selection on on the um, preview. I had this phrase that has been coming up and it has to do mostly with with current jazz or in the last let's say 20 years the difference between playing the time and playing with the time playing with the time and I guess I thought that for a while everybody in your group was playing with the time is am I anywhere close to being with my observation? <laughs> well, no, no, I mean, that's, that's a, it's an interesting uh, perspective that you're bringing up because there is a significant faction of the young jazz world that is playing with the time for, for the past two decades or whatever. Every, you've had all these songs in 13 and a half, eight and 50 odd meters and it's sort of been this experiment and there's nothing wrong with that, but I think Blackout, our band, we don't come from that perspective at all. Something ends up in an odd meter because it, it revealed itself that way and it should always feel good. The way that I think time works for me is definitely is a cultural correlation. My mother's a, a minister. So I grew up in the black church and I remember someone just standing up and just saying, you know, I, I want to thank you because last week you prayed for my brother and he was sick. I want to let you know he's feeling better. Bam, and then the chord would come in. It's out of nowhere. And then they would start speaking, but they would start using pitches, right? So I just want to let you know, and then bam, a chord would come in. So all the phrasing was completely organic and connected to authentic expression. Now, was it right on the beat, behind the beat? And I don't think that that's relevant. <clears throat> what makes music feel good is, first and foremost, your internal coordination. So I could take any phrase, doesn't matter, and play it in a, a complete wrong spot. And if my internal coordination is strong enough, it's going to feel good. <laughs> so it's that kind of thing, that it's not an intentional, okay, we're going to try this complex pattern. We get nothing wrong with that, but that's not what we're coming from. We're really trying to testify on the heart to uplift the spirit and articulate uh, what's on the hearts and minds of our community. Yeah. Well, this has been a fascinating conversation. Um, thanks, Michelle, for setting it up. And again, um, the video you provide us with is, is really wonderful. I can't wait to see the, the complete program and that someday down the road we'll see you in person. Yes. Yes. And I, I, I want to add one thing about the video process. Just like the process of creating music, uh, you never want to try to recreate something from 
that's sort of a losing battle. Will wow. Jackson, Charlie Parker was really good. He did a great job of documenting the world that he inhabited. So when when I tried to figure out, well, what's the next step given this pandemic? I said, well, let's not try to recreate a live experience. Like what we want to do is to take a look at the format that we're utilizing and look at the assets of that format and highlight those. So I think what's, what was really exciting and took a lot of time and, and care was utilizing video editing. So when you're live, you're sitting in one space in a concert hall, there's so much going on that you can't see if you have one perspective. So we focused a lot on cutting camera angles right at the moment when something interesting happened in the music. So you hear it and you get a visual cue. So the experience is totally different than live, but I, I find it to be really, uh, it's just different. I find it to be really insightful. I learn more about what's happening in the music as a viewer in the video platform than I do live. Mm -hmm. I'm live, I feel more whole thing, but in this, yeah. I'm like, oh, that was really interesting. And then it passed over there and things that I wouldn't always catch. Yeah, and there was a moment where, um, you know, a couple moments where people's expressions were so in tune with uh, some sound that happens. Well, that's like great, you know, that, that look that musicians get and uh, to capture that that's way cool 